Shall I give you guys a minute to reconvene there, or should I go ahead because you're exhausted? I, no, I think we're, we're we're waiting for you to invigorate us, Rob. I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I've been listening in in stalker-like fashion, not being visibly present to the conversation. So I know that a lot of what I had to say has been shoved aside in the process of revising the papers because I've been given this uh, sort of thankless task of commenting on a paper which tries to weave together the complex arguments from so many of you. Um, but I'll, I'll have a go at it. Uh, probably incur the wrath of the two authors because some of the things I'll propose will be to add to this uh, paper, when in fact I'm sure you're trying to find ways of carrying it down, but uh, I'll leave that unpleasant part to you. So let me just quickly say that the paper has to serve, as far as I can tell, three functions, and that makes it a difficult paper to write, and I recognize that, and any complaints or gripes are in the spirit of recognizing that the authors have a kind of impossible task. They're trying to provide an overview of the Rudolph's work. Um, as well as a, a sense in which you're looking at one subset of that work. You're trying to show how the modes of interpretation uh, really connects to their larger body of work. So that's a job in and of itself. Secondly, you're trying to make an original argument. So you're not just summarizing, you're putting forth something that you know really pushes our understanding. And then thirdly, you're trying to introduce the reader to what the nature of the chapters within the text is, and, and that's an art uh, of its, uh, in its own right. So you've got these three things to do. Let me just, I think you do really well on them, so let me just throw that out there to begin with, and I'll try to touch on all three. Uh, you have a, a more difficult job because there's great diversity not only amongst the content of what you're looking at, but sort of the genre in which the different authors are writing. There's sort of, you know, intellectual autobiography on the one hand, and then there's hard-headed analysis of historical events on the other hand. So you have a lot to bring together there. So let me just start with number three, which is the weaving together of the chapters and ideas from the chapter authors. Uh, I'll just not say much there, except for to say I think you do a good job of it. It's definitely going to change as a result of your conversations here today. I know you were just making a first stab at it uh, to some degree, uh, but for the most part, I think you guys uh, do a good job. There's a couple places where it did seem to me as though you were torn between wanting to explain more and cover greater detail of the authors you cite, the, the chapter authors, that is, the people who are giving papers here today. So, for instance, when you discuss Vivian's paper on discursive institutionalism, as the reader looking at an introductory chapter to the volume, I want either less description than that, and I want it boiled down, or I want more description than that because it's a rich idea that you're going to use over and over again. But in a couple of cases like that, you seem caught in a little bit of a halfway house, but I know that's a kind of constraint of it being a draft and trying to sort of fulfill multiple functions. Um, so moving on to purposes number one and number two of this chapter, which is overviewing the ideas of the Rudolphs and making an original argument, I think you know, uh, Kamal and John, you guys are to be applauded for the ambition of trying to do those two things together. And uh, that's not a sort of, you know, like preface to saying, but unfortunately it doesn't work. I think it works extremely well. And framing the argument and the introduction to the Rudolph's ideas in terms of the ways in which they have engaged with, modified, reacted to Weber's work is absolutely brilliant way of doing it. Uh, it, it requires a lot of work because you have to both introduce the ideas and show why it is that what the Rudolphs are doing is a modification or in some way important upon or in, in some other way important to their reaction to Weber's work. But I think the way you set it out is very impressive, very convincing, uh, though, you know, Weber specialists will, I'm sure, find many things to gripe about, but uh, that's their problem. Uh, the, a couple of places where I think you do this particularly well is when you talk about the sense in which the Rudolphs were extending this Weberian tradition of analyzing specific configurations of class, status, and religion, for instance. So this focus on configurational analysis, I think, which comes up from time to time in the intro, is useful, and that's why it's sort of clarifying that up front will be helpful to the reader. 
you you know you have great quotes from the Rudolphs to support uh, those arguments, and I would encourage you to uh, sort of not abandon them in the rush to try to encompass every theme that is covered in this wide-ranging volume, because you never will. So the, 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 the chapter has value in its own way. Um, there are some areas around this that I felt could be organized more clearly. I mean, some of them are small things, like simply the section on interviews, survey, and opinion polls. It's actually only surveys and opinion polls the interviews are dealt with later. So that's sort of small organizational thing. Um, but you know, the, I, I think you could take as a model your discussion of how the Rudolphs took issue with traditional survey work. You break that down into five or six very clear points. And as a reader uh, who is trying to make sense of all this, I would have appreciated something similarly organized with respect to some of the other uh, issues that you touch on when discussing uh, that part of the paper. Uh, so, for instance, in the part on interviews, um, there are many points you make, but if you can kind of organize them the way that we saw in the survey research, I think uh, that would make a big difference. Um, there is a section that you have on area studies as counter movement. I think that's a proposed section that was not yet put together. No, I think it's there in part. Um, I didn't know that you necessarily needed that section. So if you needed to sort of cut something in order to make space for all the other things you're putting on your plate as a result of today's discussion, that would be one, in my view, that was uh, possibly unusable. Um, I do think that you could um, uh, you know, consider adding a couple things. So I'll get off the things to add, and then we'll move on to the discussion from everyone else. The first is the possibility of a, a kind of section asking you know, how well with the benefit, with the logic of hindsight, as the Rudolph put it, some of their main contentions, you know, theoretically informed contentions, are holding up in the subsequent years. Uh, so, for instance, the relative autonomy of the state or state-dominated pluralism. You know, by most accounts, you know, that is an argument that was intriguing at the time, but perhaps has been belied by subsequent events. I mean, this. The dominant paradigm now is seeing the Indian state as having either been captured by a big business or else engaged in a state business ruling alliance of the sort that Abdul and others have been writing about. So again, you're not putting that up there uh, to decide that the Rudolphs were outright wrong, but that they've stimulated this debate and we, we you are able, in a kind of condensed way, uh, you're able to outline that position and in that sense, do some of the work for your contributors. I, I noticed in the discussion of Vivian's <laughs> chapter, a bit of back and forth as to what should be covered in her chapter and where the introductory chapter might usefully set the stage as a kind of public for everyone else. And I think one mechanism for doing that in your opening chapter is the discussion of the extension of Faber's concepts and models, but also perhaps running through some of the big findings that the Rudolphs have put forward and you know, kind of where are they now? How do they stand up? And I think that's a fair thing to do. I mean, not least because the Rudolphs were right about a lot of things. So not as though it's unfair to pick on a few things that maybe we wonder about. For instance, the bullet capitalist discussion, you know, how realistic or persistent was that uh, identity and class for itself, in itself, whatever it happens to be, formation? Or was it really a reflection of the time in which they were writing that book? You know, they were writing in the you know, mid 80s when it looked as though, you know, from the perspective of state dominated pluralism, the state continued to be an independent actor, not only mediating between classes, but also actively manipulating classes. That's the involuted pluralism part. It didn't just happen on its own. The state was doing things to uh, push the fragmentation of demand groups in ways that made them less threatening. So you also will be able to, if you go through some of these you know, examples of uh, arguments that may not have held up so well, uh, be able to uh, flag some of the differences between your authors in your collection. Because I don't think an introduction like this has to pretend that there's agreement amongst all the authors that are contained uh, within that text. And so there were different, different responses to the question of how autonomous is the state is it an independent actor engaging in mediation and manipulation 
uh, is, is it something that you find uh, expressed differently in Eula's chapter and Ron and Rena's chapter and perhaps elsewhere as well? So I think it's a useful framing device for you there. Uh, I'll, there's a lot of other points to make here. I'll just make one that I did hear uh, Asima mention in the context of the discussion around Vivian's paper, which is that I think there is a merit in referencing, perhaps in the introduction, the policy feedback literature as one example of a theoretical literature, uh, which first of all makes it, it makes sense in the context of what Vivian was arguing. I won't go into the details here, but also is an example of the kind of argument which and the kind of theoretical thinking that Rudolphs were engaged in for decades before the policy feedback literature was called the policy feedback literature. So before Paul Pearson and others are writing about this in the early 90s, we see the Rudolphs discussion, discussing in the, their articles in the 60s and 70s the ways in which incremental reforms are changing the characteristics and indeed basis of demand groups. So I think that uh, that's a good example of how uh, some of the things that became standard uh, really existed in the Rudolph's work, even if not provided the same clear conceptual terminology. So let me just jump ahead to what I think is, you know, possibly the big thing for me missing from this introduction after listening to all the discussion of situated knowledge, which was really a discussion in some way or another of the place in India the physical place and culture in which the Rudolphs themselves situated themselves, which is the state of Rajasthan, and most importantly, uh, upper caste Rajput culture within Rajasthan. Again, I'm not saying that you need to sort of hijack the whole discussion with this, but it might be a useful way of highlighting the sense in which these uh, people who are <coughs> writing about and using ideas of situated knowledge in their work um, were frankly situated not just in India, but in a particular place. And they believed not just in bringing the humanities into research, but really cultivating the study of the humanities. They helped to establish the Institute for Rajasthan Studies with Professor Joshi. They edited three massive volumes about folklore, traditional customs, uh, you know, habelis as an architectural innovation with social uh, uh, implications. So they were actively engaged in that work and some way of sort of flagging that in the introduction, I think would really help because their engagement with Rajasthan was not just uh, what we saw that was published, but even things I happen to know for a fact, for instance, that their understanding of the processes by which Indian universities and other educational institutions decayed, that process was directly informed by their close observation of Rajasthan University and its demise over time. So, and you know, they're not shying away from that, but that's a good example of how they were situated uh, in, a, in a very specific sort of place. And also, if you, if you touch on some of their work in Rajasthan as a kind of uh, way into understanding, their understanding of situated knowledge, you'd also be able to look at how really over the course of 50 years, they were using the same material to really address very different ideas and literatures. So we've seen Amar Singh's diary published in 2008 and really uh, discussed in terms of the liminality of Amar Singh, the way in which he constructs his identity through a diary mode and engagement with other social worlds. But that's one kind of reading. If you go back to some of their articles from the early 70s, you see a discussion of the same lineage, Amar Singh's, uh, Amar Singh's lineage and his descendants to really make arguments of a very much more mainstream political science sort. I mean, they're looking at how a so-called bureaucratic lineage, as they called it, managed to maneuver and maintain their power against other bureaucratic lineages in Rajput society. And they do that in ways that allow them to derive a very kind of political science-y conclusion. So for, you know, and this is like 40 years before they published this diary. So their work on Rajasthan, some of the exact same material is a useful way of charting a bit of the intellectual journey that they went through uh, uh, as they engaged with India and, and Rajasthan provides sort of a, a window into that. I realize it's a big ask to say, why don't you add a whole thing about Rajasthan? But I know you have, uh, you know, in an ingenious way, John and Kamal of condensing things. So you'll find a way of doing that, I'm sure.
Uh, lots of other things to say, but in summary, it's a great paper. Your argument is original. It needs a little bit of reorganization. The links to the chapters will evolve over time. Um, but do consider adding these two things, uh, a framing which looks at some of the larger scale debates that the Rudolphs were engaged in and the, the way in which perhaps their claims didn't hold up. And then secondly, seeking whether it's possible to situate the Rudolphs' engagement with India in terms of this, this sort of Rajasthan society that they embedded themselves within. But uh, I really appreciate everyone uh, letting me listen in today because I've uh, learned a lot. Um, but I've been in consumer mode rather than uh, contributing to public goods. So uh, thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Did you want to add or say something? <coughs> they were great, great comments, Rob. Okay, I, I mean, I actually, I don't, I don't. No need to respond as yeah. such. I, I mean, I, I'm very grateful. I guess I, I'll, I'll respond in one way, all right, with one issue that you raise about the situating the Rudolphs. Because I've always felt, this is what I actually wanted to argue with Ron and, and didn't do it. Um, uh, I've always felt their worst idea, and it's completely, from my perspective, inconsistent with their work, uh, is their idea of bullet capitalists, right? And, and I, it's... It, it's probably because at the time that they were sitting in Jaipur, sort of in part, and then in Chicago, as Ron points out, sort of developing this idea. So I was in, in sort of villages in, in eastern Uttar Pradesh, uh, and um, try as I might, I never found anybody who identified themselves as a bullet capitalist. I mean, either in English, obviously not, or in, in Hindi. Um, and it struck me that it's this type of, it's not to say that it wasn't an accurate description of a certain type of agricultural figure, but it's almost, in a sense, um, I'm trying to figure out how to explain, it's, it's sort of a deductive concept um, uh, that is being applied um, uh, to a society where at the same time the Rudolphs are arguing uh, that sort of reasons and perceptions are so important in terms of agrarian mobilization, and neither their identity uh, nor the way that they relate to others in their society is through the same type of lens that you would expect from bullet capitalists. Now, Ron will say that uh, um, that they have problems with labor, and but there's certainly a Chayanovian aspect to this uh, as well. Um, but I, in terms of actually thinking about political mobilization, the reason that I think it's a mistake is because I think the political mobilization is much better understood in terms of institutions and policies. So you get sort of minimum support prices, and you get the governments, and you get subsidized uh, uh, um, uh, fertilizer and agricultural inputs, um, and they're responding much more to those incentives than they are to their, quote, class position. And the way that they're responding, if I think of somebody like Charan Singh, he's organizing his political mobilization through jots, through sort of caste, sort of types of existing networks. Um, and so, uh, so I sort of feel like that conceptualization sort of distorts, it, it obscures more of what's happening than it illuminates, right? right. So, um, uh, I mean, I'll just throw that out there since I've been wanting to argue with Ron. Uh, and, uh, but I mean, that, that, that does seem to me that they, I mean, I guess I'm very struck by the fact that the way that they're situated, I mean, they were situated in such a way so as, I don't think they spent a lot of time sort of uh, in the Mofasal talking with, you know, sort of landless laborers or, or small farmers, et cetera. Um, although I do tremendously respect um, their erudite knowledge in terms of reading that literature. But I, my sense is they might have a different view if they were situated in a somewhat different way. Quite true. Uh, they were trapped. Can I say one thing about that? Yeah. I mean, they were they were trapped in a sense by seeing like a state. We've all mentioned the gays from Delhi, 
And so when they have to define a bullet capitalist as 2.5 acres to 15 acres, absolutely meaningless in terms of, of either political action. But I think they're building on a very rich tradition that comes out of the Marxian literature and Eric Wolf and, and uh, Hamza Alavi as well, of the middle peasant who are community leaders and community leaders who are experiencing the stresses of market society and changing economic conditions around them. And they're often the ones who do mobilize rural society against whatever uh, depredations the, the market or the state are making on them. And so that is, that's kind of a long tradition. And I, I think they were right about that one kind of moment when Bharat became something important um, to say that how come a peon, I've heard this so many times, how come a peon in a government office in a district town makes much more than a four acre, five acre farmer? How can that be? <coughs> you know, he doesn't work hard, he doesn't take any risk. Anyway, I, I think there's something very real about the fact that they are bullock capitalists. I mean, they actually disdain the word bullock, say it doesn't matter how you get draft power. They, they actually dismiss that, but I don't think it's completely dismissible. It, and think about the, the bullock in the village, these bullock races, these contests, decorating bullocks. And there's a whole cultural element to that kind of rural leadership organized around medium-sized landowners. I'll just say in the villages that I know in eastern Uttar Pradesh, from the time I was in the 70s to today, there are a lot fewer bullocks. Oh, sure, of course um, I'll uh, but, be exported. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. but let me ask one other thing, and I'll raise it with you, but I want to raise it with everybody else. Because speaking personally, one of my motivations for engaging in this project was to really think about the implications for the Rudolphs and their approach to poli studying politics for contemporary sort of political science. Uh, and so we try some ideas, you'll remember in the, the, that sort of concluding section. Um, and I wondered if you had any reactions. Uh, I don't know how many, you know, the paper came very late, so I, I, it's not clear to me whether people have had a chance to read it, but I'd be interested in your or anybody's reactions in terms of what we say there. Uh, and I think we've learned some things from our discussion here. Actually, I think a lot of valuable things um, that we might be able to sort of better elaborate. But I wonder sort of your responses, Rob, uh, to that issue, both in light of the paper, but also in light of our discussions today. Yeah, no, uh, no, I have no specific response to that. If I could make my screen both show me that paper and show me you, I might sort of try to uh, <laughs> reconstruct my reactions to it, but probably better to hear from other people around the table. Okay. Uh, Rob? I, want, I think uh, one of the things that I, um, I've been thinking about is, um, aside from bullet capitalists, I'm actually, uh, I, I think we have to engage, the state played a huge, state as a third actor, and it's varying institutions played a huge role, at least in, the, uh, in their lives, academic lives, uh, at least from the period I was exposed to them. And, I think the uh, what part of it and the claims around it hold up, I think uh, we have to engage that centrally. And so uh, I gave a hint to it about with centrism, so centrism yeah. and moderation. And I right. think that part has to be developed further. And, and it's very important also partly if the <laughs> The, uh, if the state was a third autonomous actor and powerful enough, uh, then it makes sense for why uh, BJP, which sort of comes in after the Congress, long Congress rule, would want to focus on that. But if it's an, but does it stand up as an autonomous actor? Or right now, educational institutions are, so there are very s substantial institutions sort of uh, um, higher education, uh, armed forces, uh, Wilkinson's uh, work is uh, sort of pointing us that the, that that same autonomy and power of the state could be used to rework them. And if that's the case, then how autonomous is this third actor if you can have big business and others um, and the sections of the state capturing it or and, and do, you know the other thing is 
I sometimes wonder, did the Rudolphs become Rajput in Rajasthan? <laughs> so, <laughs> so in some senses, if they did, then I think it will be interesting to see that over time, uh, whether that kind of milieu and that kind of, and I, I have no evidence for it, but that kind of milieu starts informing their writings. You know, stability, centrism, they're sort of like Ra Rajput's uh, sort of like <laughs> honor, dignity, stability, <laughs> all <laughs> fragmentations will be managed. Uh, but you know, that can go in multiple way, uh, in multiple directions, but I think, you know, there was a certain, Rajputness to, to <laughs> both Suzanne and Lloyd in some ways, and I, you know I'll I'll hold off on that. I, I have no comment on whether they absorb part of the Rajput ethic, but uh, of valor without regard to consequences, which I think is how they describe it. Um, but you know, certainly they would uh, admit that the kinds of things they were looking at were very much bound by the parameters of that society. So this article I was referring to on bureaucratic lineage is very, very specific about the institutional constraints within which this competition between different bureaucratic families in Rajasthan function. It was oligopolistic, there were only certain families involved, and it rewarded accommodation and long-term thinking. So they break it down rather specifically, and, and what was of interest to me was I thought a lot of their writing about that period was uh, a sort of softer, if you will, not clearly identifying institutional parameters and their influence on outcomes. And here they're doing that, of course they're doing it with beautiful prose and using all kinds of uh, materials from the humanities that we wouldn't otherwise see. But I think, you know, flagging that direct preoccupation with causal arguments and institutional constraints, at least in the 70s and 80s, uh, is worth flagging. But in terms of this whole argument about the state, I guess you have to decide as an introduction essay whether or not you want to get into that kind of argument or whether you just want to kind of frame that as a continuous live debate, uh, which is really not ending anytime soon. And some of the reasons why it's not ending are things that you guys have been discussing, like uh, NREGA and what that represents. Is it just, is it a way in which the state acts as an independent force seeming to uh, moderate between different classes in society, uh, or is there is some sort of independent action being taken to construct a new regime of rights-based development, which is a, a much more substantial way of looking at it than just seeing it as a kind of buffer well, valve or whatever we would describe to it be, as. To be, fair, yeah. to be fair, I mean, uh, if we're going to be perfectly honest, I mean, one of the shorter, one of the problems of the book now it really doesn't take the Rudolph's view of the state any further than in pursuit of Lakshmi. But in fact, mm. they did have views after that, and they talked about the development of a, the state, Indian state moving from a more dairy state to a regulatory yeah, state. That's and right. and we, we, I mean, we can, I mean, in a way, I don't really view the function of our introduction to sort of write, sort of fill in gaps, but, but you know, I think if we're, Taking on, as you suggest, and as we probably should, you know, how do the Rudolphs' sort of predictions hold out? Then we have to be fair to them and say, okay, their views on the state change, and we have to include that. All right, right. Frank Hober, you had a yeah. yeah I, I just wanted to join the observation. I think that Rob's observation about pointing out uh, Suzanne and Lloyd's particular situation in Jaipur and in Rajasthan is is very important because I think they felt very much. The, the, the tombstone that Lloyd dictated says at home in right. Chicago, Barnard, Vermont, and Jaipur. Right. And uh, that was a, a recognition of how important that was. They landed in Jaipur completely by accident uh, in the sense that it was the first place they got after they drove across from uh, London to uh, uh, Delhi and they immediately went to Jaipur and they got connected very quickly with the Taka of Basau and various other Rajputs there th through right. accidental means, um, but they retained very close uh, contact and friendships there uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, I think they enjoyed a lot watching 
those families they knew modernize. I remember over the over the decades hearing them talk about the children and grandchildren of the people they meet and how different they interacted with the world and with government than the generations they had first met in 1956. So I think it, it, it's an important piece, but they did, and, and you know, the very last book published posthumously was very much a Rajput book. Um, so I think it, 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 it is an important part of their identification. Yeah, I mean, Kristen, yeah. you Deferring to me, you had your hand up first. Go no, ahead. you had yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alphonse. They're from the um, Yeah, I think that I, I agree with the comment on uh, Raj, but one of the few criticisms I ever heard about the Rudolphs from other faculty was that they spent too much time hanging out with the elites in Rajput. And I'm not, I have no idea if that's true or not, but I think where you come from does have something to do with what you see. So that's a small point. I would add that. Uh, another small point, I think the title. Don't take the title of the oh. workshop for the book. It's much broader than that. Um, I would add a chapter, I think, on perestroika, different methods, qualitative, interpretive, how to use it, uh, and maybe relate that, or at least if you don't add a chapter on it. The last uh, section four here, I think you have some really important things. I think the whole section of the scientific mode, I think that needs to be developed much more. I think they had a real commitment to a concept of science that was antithetical with a positivistic, or at least not totally comfortable with the positivist view. And I thought Vivian's paper was really important in pointing that out. And I think Weber was really critical here. It's a very different concept of science. It comes out in different parts in their work. It's very much there in Perestroika. And I think in the last, I would add a section that I think were the Rudolphs alive today, they would be a call to the dart kind of uh, movement, which is, is, we're still arguing about that. And then we thought the other point that I think um, Denise did such a nice job when she was commenting is that in some ways the whole interpretive approach is really trying to humanize and social science. It's about human beings. We're not just talking about you know economic models or data and things like that. We're dealing with human beings. And I thought the Rudolphs always remembered that and always had it there. Um, and then I guess in terms of the last point, um, you were made a couple things. You wanted to talk about the ways that the Rudolph's model uh, concept had been passed up or shown to be wrong. I would not do it that way. I would kind of shift it a little bit and say, you know, yes, they had all these wonderful ideas and some of them worked out better than others, but this is sort of the unfulfilled agenda. And that's where I think you could get into in concluding the book. This, you know, typical Chicago, right? <laughs> I mean, how many, one of the unanswered questions that they raise, I mean, your discussion about the state would be one, one example. There are several other things that they, we've talked about here, I mean, the capitalism. So they have a lot of ideas that they threw out that were very rich that people haven't taken and tested yet. And I think that would be, in some ways, the way to end this the chapter, or at least maybe the conclusion. I don't know how you see this. Um, but I think that's really important, setting an agenda for our students to follow. What are some of the other questions that they could, building on the, you know, the back of the head, next work of the Rudolphs? Okay. Um, so, you know, if, if being situated in Jaipur was relevant to their work and informed their work, then, then being situated in Chicago, <laughs> you know, I would add a section on what the University of Chicago and being there and how that affected their work. So, so as I think about what makes the university distinctive as a, as a place to teach, um, so one of the things <coughs> is that there are these cross-disciplinary cores for undergraduates, uh, including the Power Core and, and, and others, which, which um, uh, colonialism, um, which um, force people to teach outside their comfort zone, to teach with philosophers, historians, to jointly interact with people. Um, and, and so one question would be, would their work has, have been as theoretically interdisciplinary otherwise? Of course, they chose to go there, but still, some effect. Uh, the workshops at Chicago are given out um, on interdisciplinary workshops receive an advantage in um, the money giving process. Yeah. If you have more than one department, you're more likely to be funded. And so a lot 
the ways in which money is distributed there um, also inform that. Um, that um, people are in physical proximity uh, to each other. So you just bump into people an awful lot there in a way that you might not in a more depart, you know, in, in UCLA, say, you know, where people live over an enormous distributed area, the academic culture is, is, is different there uh, than it is in a place as, as, as much of an island um, there. And then you have uh, COSIS, the Committee on Southern Asian Studies, mm -hmm which is basically a, a very friendly organization that distributes resources to South Asia and in which people are always reading from outside their area as they distribute this. So there are a bunch of sort of institutional things about Chicago as a, as a physical space and as an institution as a university that I think you could, you know, could talk about as a follow-on to Jaipur. I don't know Barnard. So maybe you could do that <laughs> there. Although I liked your, your story about yeah. the the party and the kind of conversations and you know that that transcended normal boundaries that, that they did there. And maybe there's a story you could tell about that as right. well. So I would add a section on physical and institutional situations as they inform that. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think we put in long hours. I, I want to sort of finish this session, and I just want to raise two issues.